My name is David Lair. I'll be your moderator. I do technical support as Aaron Dunn, primarily here at SEC's Elk Grove Village Training Center. Over the past 15 years, I've also visited many of you for training at your company and many other locations as well. Our offices can be reached for tech support between 6.30 a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. Chicago time. And SEC also has a very extensive website at secombustion.com, and I highly recommend it for product information, sales and customer support, and a wealth of technical information. The LME5 technical instructions can be downloaded from the SEC website or ordered free of charge by contacting your sales rep or customer service. Some of you may have this copy mailed already for the webinar today. Section and page references in this presentation refer to this document. This training was initially developed by one of our SEC's top salesmen, Mark Wozak. It is proven to be the best approach to demonstrating the parameter menu system, navigation, as well as typical commissioning exercise. On the first page of section three, we define three access levels of the LMV5. This is necessary to enable users to be able to get into and adjust set points, service technicians to be able to adjust fuel curves, and OEMs to program configuration settings. User level doesn't require any password. Service level factory default is 9876. And finally, OEM factory default is start. It's all caps and case sensitive. Navigation. The AZL uses four keys to navigate the LMB5 system menu. Escape, enter, and the two select keys. The enter key drives you deeper into the menus and can go up to six levels deep. Escape key brings you back out up to six times will bring you back to the root main level. And finally, the two select keys move the menu up and down for navigation. Section three starts with a two page listing of all the LMB5, over 300 parameters in alphabetical order. Bold face items are the ones you will likely adjust, and many have factory defaults. Following the name, uh, in the page in section three will be a full menu path shown, the level required to adjust it, the parameter range, the factory default, and a brief explanation of its use. Again, it emphasizes parameters, terminals, and functions. Page four offers a listing by subject to assist you until you become more familiar with the many parameter names. Okay, let's begin the exercise. Whenever you get lost, simply escape up to six times and proceed through the menu path on the AZL. Here we will navigate up and down until we see updating. Once we get to updating, enter is pressed. We are prompted to choose a level. We will choose the OEM level, enter the password, S-T-A-R-T. Do one letter, press enter one at a time till the entire password is complete. One final entry puts us into the menu. Any incorrect passwords will result in an error and you can try again. Once you're logged in, the password is valid for two hours after you stop pressing any key. That's such a factory fee default time and can be adjusted as you see fit. Parameter is called password time. In this section of the menu, you can find, you can change the passwords and edit the burner ID. Every unit must have a burner ID in order to uh, run. The burner ID has to be between 14 and four and 15 characters, and there is no default. Best practice is for each unit to have a different ID. Much of the configuration is completed while the LMV5 is, in fact, in the thick of an error, such as no fuel train. No worries, we just press escape and continue to set the unit up. Resetting the fault will not help until the settings are corrected. So let's go on to number two and define the speed of the actuators. 
actuators can ramp through a range of speeds, some as low as 10 seconds. Upper ramp mod parameter sets the speed of the modulation parameter until the fl flame is present. Time no flame sets the ramp speed when you do not have a flame, such as pre-purge and post-purge. The shaded boxes indicate parameters that I most commonly use. Upper ramp stage is for European style burners that run oil stages, rarely used in the Americas. Next, we have number three, activate, deactivate the actuators. Again, we navigate the menu, parameters and display, ratio control, gas settings. And after we hit enter, we see this column of parameters. I'll cover the upper, the upper uh, items later in this presentation. But let's focus on the actuators. In the example today, we will configure a gas fire job. So in blue, you see we have selected activate for air and gas. You can see um, well, all the others are in fact deactivated. In this case, that includes the VSD variable frequency drive. We are now beginning to define our system. The last item on this list is called start point op. This configures the LMV so that after ignition, pilot, main light off, indicates at which point the LMV will modulate to. This became a necessity with the advent of mesh burners. Sometimes to achieve low emissions, some OEMs use a metal fiber mesh on their burner heads to assist in gas air mixing. If the LMV went immediately to low fire, on a cold mesh burner, the unit would likely flame out. Here we can choose a setting, one of the many options at the LMV5 that makes it so versatile in the global market. Number four, addressing the actuators. Ag actuators can be wired in a daisy chain fashion, or another way to say that, in a line form from actuator to actuator in any order. Then each unit is assigned an address so it can respond to the LMV5 program settings. All actuator settings, home position, ignition, fuel curves, direction of rotation, are stored in the LMV5 with the single exception of the address. Factory actuators are unaddressed and the green LED is on steady to indicate this. Navigate to parameters and display, Enter, actuators, enter, addressing, enter. First up is air. So enter again, select the function to start the addressing of the air actuator. Press the red button for two seconds and release it. The LED will now blink one time to indicate that it will respond to air commands from the LMB5. This is the only data stored in the actuator, and it doesn't require power to retain it. If the power is removed and that actuator is unplugged for any length of time, even years on the shelf, when returned to any LMB5 system, it will blink its address, in this case, one blink error. Repeat this process for the gas actuator or any other actuators that are on your job. If an address needs to be changed, simply hold the address button for 15 to 25 seconds until the LED turns on to a steady green. And then you can re-address it as desired. It's really just that simple. Last point I'd like to make is that you should position the termination jumper up as shown on the cover if the actuator is the last device. All other units on the system, the jumper is placed in the down, unterminated position. If all the jumpers were in the up position, the system would probably function. If all the jumpers were in the down position, the system would probably function. If you set the jumpers correctly, you will have the most robust communication possible. Number five, rotation. 
navigate to parameters and display actuators direction of rotation and then press enter. Now you can choose which rotation you want for each actuator. With the actuator facing you, that is, the uh, shaft is poking you in the eye. Standard rotation is counterclockwise from straight up noon down to nine o'clock. Reverse rotation is clockwise and it works from 9 a.m. to the 12 o'clock noon position, kind of like a union shop he says in the safety of a webinar class. Finally, be so advised, direction of rotation must be set prior to ignition and curve settings. If you have those already set and you need to change the rotation, you must select the first item in this list and delete the curves. Number six, the load controller. One of the best features of the LMV5 is its internal load controller. That allows you to wire a steam sensor or a hot water RTD and program the on and off points as well as PID modulation. First is the LC operating mode to select the mode. In this case, we choose the internal load control, one of six different ways you can choose. Three are internal PIDs, three are external load control signals, which could be analog from a lead lag system, or a BMS Modbus for control or simple monitoring. When selecting the mode you want to configure, this chart helps you sum up the options. Highlighted, we see today's choice, internal load controller, and we see that it offers two set points for seasonal, day of the week, even time of day set point switching. To change from the first working set point, W1, to the second, W2, Simply close the circuit between X62.1 and X62.2. Next, we select a sensor, and in this case, it is a steam sensor. Many other options are available. We must now define what type of signal is being used. Here, we use a 4 to 20 milliamp sensor and connect it to X61. Again, other choices are shown. Finally, M range pressure sense, in this case, a 150 pound sensor, scales the four to 20 signal so that it displays the proper pressure based on the sensor we're using on the job. Number seven, we define some set points. These parameters can be found in at least two areas of the LMV5 menu. An operation boiler set point is shown here. Here we can program two W1 and W2 set points. The table again here is shown for reference. Number eight, we can now set some modulation parameters, starting with the boiler on and the boiler off points. SD, SD stands for set point differential, and we assign a percentage to these parameters. If, for example, our active set point is 100 PSI and an SD mod on of minus 25% is chosen, when the pressure drops to 75 PSI, the burner will turn on. As the pressure increases, the load, the firing rate, changes to maintain the desired set point. As the load is met, the burner remains at low fire. The pressure may continue to rise, and with the SD mod off of plus 25%, the burner will turn off at 125 PSI. The benefit of using a percent is that we can change our set point, and then the on and off points float along with it. Factory defaults and ranges are shown. Um, number nine, during modulation, we can tune some settings to allow a specific size of the burner to respond to various load conditions. Proportional, integral, and derivative, commonly referred to as PID settings, are selected here. P is a percent of 15 pounds, PSI. So a P of 33% means 
that the high to low fire modulation occurs over a five PSI range. Specifically with a hundred pound set point example shown here, the burner would be at high fire at 85 PSI and at low fire at 100 PSI. P, the proportional setting, is the most important component of the PID settings. Although I and D could be set to zero, typically I in seconds is set for around two minutes. This is reasonable. Despite what you might guess, a very small I is very, very aggressive. A one second I value will reset the PID loop every second. This is called integral windup, and it results in the burner not reducing its firing rate until it's way over the desired set point, causing rapid burner on off cycling. Not good. Rule of thumb is to leave the D at a value zero for steam. But if it is used, the simple rule of setting it at one fifth of the I value. Example, I equals 200, the D would be 40 seconds, would be the best choice. PID has a reputation of being a black art, but these are simple guidelines to make it easy. Additionally, you can select a range of preset settings from very slow to normal to very fast. Think of this in terms of burner size compared to the load on the job site. Two examples, somewhat counterintuitive. A very large or oversized boiler is considered fast. A barely adequate or a small burner, again, relative to the load, is considered to be slow. Another option to do is adaptation, allowing the LMB to modulate itself measure the response and the boiler pressure. Some call this feature auto-tune. Also, note that when a system is hot water versus steam that we've been speaking about so far, the P percent is based on 200 degrees Fahrenheit instead of the 15 PSI. So a P of 33% on a hot water system is equal to 66 degrees Fahrenheit. As with many aspects of the LMB5 system, you have many, many choices and many, many options. Number 10 allows us to select and configure some general LMB5 features. I will go through the gas options today. First on the list is alarm start prevention. It's a perfect example of a parameter that shows how a literal translation in the LMB5 has seven optional languages is often back to front. This feature says, if you are prevented from starting, do you want an alarm? Example, the pressure drops on a system. The LMB5 attempts to run the burner. First action is to enter a start signal output from the LMB5 to get the boiler room ready. Oftentimes this means open up a fresh air damper. When the fresh air damper is proven to be open, a limit switch is made and the LMB5 is allowed to continue its startup. It is no longer prevented. Had the fresh air damper limit switch not been made, the LMB5 will wait until it does. After a programmed amount of time, the LMB5 can sound an alarm stating there is a problem. The LMB5 has been prevented from starting. Question is, do you want an alarm activated? or do you want to remain quiet condition until the condition is made, deactivate. Again, your choice. Standby error is a parameter setting while the safety loop is always monitored. That is to clearly say a burner cannot run with an open safety loop circuit ever, no matter how the unit is programmed, period. However, you can decide if an alarm will occur in standby when the circuit is open. An example, if activated in standby and the circuit opens, an alarm is generated and the lockout occurs. If deactivated, the open circuit is tolerated until the burner starts to run, in which case it will always alarm. 
you can simply configure the standby mode. Normal direct start. When normal direct start is selected and the load is satisfied, well, I'm sorry, when the normal start is selected after the load is satisfied, the burner closes the main fuel valves, post purges, and return to standby. This process can take several minutes. If another call for heat occurs, the unit again proceeds through pre purge, ignition, pilot, and main light off. Again, this process can take several minutes. If a unit is used for process loads, a call for heat can occur quite quickly, well before the post purge even finishes. Option then is to select direct start. The result is load is satisfied, unit enters the post purge, for which it has two parts, mandatory, say two seconds, and optional, say 28 seconds. No quick call for heat would result in a uh, no quick call for heat would result in a 30 second purge, the mandatory and the optional. If there was a call for heat after two seconds of mandatory post purge, it would skip the optional post purge and drive directly into pre purge and sequence back on. Biggest time saver is the shortening the shortening the post purge, and the air actuator remains open. And that saves minutes driving closed only to reopen for post purge as soon as it gets there. This is a quick for turnaround time. This feature requires a three way solenoid on the air switch to test the air switch, even though the fan never stops running. Forced intermittent, if activated, will cause the burner to cycle off and then cycle back on whenever 23 hours and 45 minutes of continuous operation occurs. This is often a code requirement to check the scanner operation. If deactivated, the LMV5 will never cycle based on runtime. It should be noted, the infrared scanner and the UV scanner used on the LMV5 are self-checked every six seconds during operation, not just once every 24 hours. But again, you can choose to program it any way you want. The choice is yours. Fuel train gas allows you to choose the correct fuel train operation for your burner. Most American burners use Pilot GP2. Most European burners, by contrast, use Pilot GP1. The difference is the location of the pilot connection shown in the diagram. Surprisingly, EU burners must open the first of two main fuel valves in order to light the pilot. Sequences, purge, open main one, light the pilot, open main two. In the Americas, the sequence is purge, light the pilot, and then open both the main and V1 and V2 at the same time for light off. Choose your gas train wisely. Number 11, we now begin to configure the inputs and outputs of the LMB5. First in blue, uh, shown above, is start release gas. This is an input to verify that the burner is ready to run and its use employs perhaps a fresh air damper, maybe a proof of closure, etc. Next is the air pressure test, and I hope no one chooses to activate this on your burner. It is the most basic safety feature on any uh, closed combustion burner. Option again illustrates the wide range of applications that the LMB5 can be used on, including industrial applications where there is no closed combustion chamber to purge. Next is config PSVP CPI. Now that's a mouthful. This input can be used for proof of closure, or more commonly, it is a gas valve proof switch. Let's take a look at valve proofing. A typical gas drain used on larger burners is often called a double block and bleed, meaning two main gas blocking valves and a vent valve, the bleed part, Venting is a time-proven method that prevents the gas from entering the burner during the pre-purge by opening a vent. Great, 
as long as the vent works and remains clear. Vents can also be quite expensive on tall buildings. Ask any operator in New York City. Valve proving is a sequence typically done during pre-purge that actually checks for valve proof leakage. A vent simply diverts a leaky valve, but offers no notice of a problem existing. To add the vent, the valve proving feature to your gas train, simply add an automatic recycle gas pressure switch mounted between the two main gas valves. A four-step sequence goes like this. One, energize V2 downstream gas valve to evacuate the chamber between the main valves, then close the valve. Two, perform a second, perform a 10 second test. If V1 leaks, pressure rises and the test fails. If not, three, energize the downstream valve and then close it. This pressurizes the chamber with line pressure. Number four, wait another 10 seconds, do a second test and prove if the, if the pressure holds, that that means that the downstream valve is not leaking. So between these four steps, we test for upstream leaks, downstream leaks, all in the four step process. The phase sequence looks like this. Proving can be done on pre-purge or post-purge or both or not at all, your choice. Valve proving and venting. Valve proving and venting, double block and bleed can be used together. Venting is a safe time proven method. Valve proving is very proactive, it's qualitative and quantitative. An example of story I tell is in 1992 an ASHRAE, ASHRAE show a four inch gas valve body was shipped to an R&D group for presentation. Instead of being presented, the valve was installed on a fire tube boiler, 600 horsepower and tested. At the end of the day, when all was quiet, gas was heard gushing out the vent valve. A call was placed and they said that the valve really leaked bad. What? The guy on the other end answered, that was a show valve. There's no valve seats in that valve. Those vents were wide open. Moral of the story is the vent valve saved this guy's bacon because it vented it out the stack instead of putting it in the boiler during pre-purge. But if he'd have done valve proving, he never would have started the boiler in the first place. Take notice of the two terminals being configured, X703.2, X903.2 and the options they offer. Be aware that either can be used for a proof of closure, AKA POC, and in, in the European uh, jargon, it's CPI, meaning closed position indicator, but you never would configure both terminals for a proof of closure. Other options are start release gas and valve proving. Input controller activates the burner switch input so that an external physical burner switch is respected. And the gas min and max, example, the high low, high gas pressure switch and low gas pressure switches can be activated when they're being used. Number 12, only a few more slides to go, shows us an option for flame scanners or flame rod also known as an ionization probe. Options include extraneous light test, activate or deactivate. And if activated, it basically is a, what are you gonna do about it? It called the reaction to extraneous light options. You can use block, which will stop the startup, or an alarm, which will cause a lockout. Also, this is the part in the menu where you can view the flame signal. Finally, react time flame loss is the burner's FFRT or the flame failure reaction time, which isn't permitted to all in all of the Americas to be a maximum of four seconds versus the European market with a maximum of one second. Base hardware time is fixed at two tenths 
eight tenths is the minimum setting, which gives you one second FFRT. 2.3 seconds allows a total of a four second flame failure response time. This is a sample of the LMV5 sequence of operation. Terminal numbers are on the left, phases are listed on the top. Phase 12 is standby. Phase 20 and 30 are pre-purge. Phase 38, ignition. Phase 40 are to do with the pilot. 50s are the mains. 60s are run and 70s are the shutdowns. Lucky number 13. Note the phase number on the right, each with a parameter and an adjustment time. Broken into groups, this is terminal one, dot time startup number one. Then there's time startup number two and time shutdown. And finally, times general. These indicate all the phases, all the times, and all the parameter names to set all of the times for sequencing the LMV5. This shows a little more detail and where this shows up to in the sequence chart, highlighted in yellow. There are a lot of pre purge times. This basic one, pre purge time gas, is the normal pre purge time. Minimum time pre-purge gas requires an OEM password and sets the minimum time pre-purge safe gas. This is the time the pre-purge will be when you're following a shutdown, a lockout condition. And finally, part one and part three. This only applies when the job has FGR. Note that if an FGR is open during the pre-purge, it doesn't purge at all. It just runs in a circle. So we program part one to close the FGR valve. You do half of the pre-purge and then part three opens and we flush out the FGR piping. Startup details too. And the chart showing where they occur in the sequence. Shutdown times and the chart showing where they are in a sequence. General times detail. And finally, again, the chart. Number 14, the LMV has no default settings for ignition positions. You must enter the values. In this example, shown in blue, are sample gas and air ignition position settings. This is what the AZL screen looks like for these settings. Go to special positions, ignition gas, ignition air. Number 15 is a quick overview of the sequence. Notice that the phases advance by the tens, and this details all the inputs and all the outputs for all the terminals based on the selected fuel train. Number 16, this feature is called program stop and similar to a rust run test physical switch found on some of the old flame safeguards. This allows us to hold the sequence at certain points. Note the PS program stop options in the sequence diagram. These are the phases where a sequence can be halted. Okay, on our burner, we can now clear any faults and bring our unit up to standby and light off our burner. We're in standby, we have a set point of 100, actual value of 33, fuel selected gas, standby phase 12, make the burner switch, waiting for start release, start release phase 20, phase 21, the fan turns on in phase 22, it does a pre-purge, 24 drives to the pre-purge position, actually performs the pre-purge, the FGR pre-purge, drives down to the ignition position, hits the ignition transformer, energizes the pilot, flame is made, pilot stabilizes, ignition turns off. Again, pilot stabilizes phase 44, pilot stands alone. 
phase 50, the main fuel valve turns on along with the pilot. 52, the pilot valve turns off. And 54, the main valve stands and stabilizes and releases and stands at uh, the burner is running at the ignition settings. You realize you have just lit off the LMV5 with absolutely no fuel curve. You simply lit it off on the ignition settings and it will camp on the ignition settings forever until you construct a curve. Okay, number 17, let's get into that air fuel curve. We go into parameters display, ratio control, gas settings. We go into curve parameters, we hit enter. The screen tumbles around for a little bit, gets everything all ready to go. When it enters and stabilizes, the tumbling stops and we get enter point. And we see that point number one, default positions are in fact our ignition settings. Ignition settings are made for good repeatable light offs. Combustion is not important. Rich, lean, a little bit harder, whatever it takes to get that boiler lit off every single time, even when you're not standing there next to it in the boiler room. Next, we go to entering the curves, starting with point number one. We hit enter, change, followed. This makes the servos follow the fuel curve while there's fire in the hole. Not followed would be an, a very infrequently used option if you added to edit the points in standby with no burner running, you could say not followed. Rule of thumb is always, always, always pick the followed position. First thing you do is go into the load and you set the load for your low fire. This one happened to default at 15 because the initial setting was 15 degrees. It has nothing to do with the actual firing rate. In this example today, we're going to use a 10 to 1 turndown. So the load would be set to 10% on this one. So we make a 10% load and then we go into fuel and adjust the fuel setting. And then we go into the air and then adjust the air setting. Notice you get a carrot while the fuel servos are moving. And then they go to a solid colon when they stabilize and the servos have reached their position. Once you've got the new load number in, and the new fuel and air settings. You can escape and then hit enter and store that point to the LMB5. Now it says point number one is 10% load, 10 degrees of fuel, 20 degrees of air. Notice on the graph, I've shown the ignition settings outside the curve. The curve begins with point number one, and in this case, 10% firing rate. And you notice the settings there are combustion and they're different than the ignition settings. So in this case, the ignition settings were slightly higher, nice repeatable light offs. And then we drove down to point number one to achieve our lowest possible turndown and good combustion once we got fire in the hole. This is the table on the curve, what it looks like load, gas position and air position. Point number two, we're on point number one. As we advance to point number two, it assumes the exact same settings of point number one. We pick change because we want to change the point. We always, always select followed. Point number two goes in there. We adjust the load to 20%. Notice that the fuel and air are still point one settings. Then we go in and adjust the fuel and air settings. Lead with the air, you always want excess oxygen, make combustion safe, and then follow with the fuel to get the combustion point at the next firing rate, in this case, 20%. Once you get that set with the fuel and air, you escape, and then you enter to store the point. And now point number two is in there at 20%, and you see you have 16 degrees and 24 degrees on the air, and your chart now has two points on your fuel curve. So now you can see the curve has some uh, predetermined points that are coming in, two points, and now it's actually got a trajectory. For point number three, I want to show how to add a point between two existing points. 
enter the point. This time, instead of entering point, rather, go down to hand and enter the hand portion of the menu. When you do, it'll say manual, and then a load number will come up. I have points in there for 10% and 20%. So if I adjusted my load to 15%, you're gonna see it's gonna be exactly halfway between point number one and point number two. Once I'm on there, I can enter, and now I'm on point number three, which is 15% load, and the values would be halfway between what they were between point one and point two, and I can make adjustments on that and store the point. Once I store the point that goes in there, and see it says point number three is 20% load, but as soon as it enters into the table, you notice that it renumbered them. Point number one is 10%, point number two is 15, and point number three becomes 20%. Points are always in load number order. Don't fall in love with your point number, fall in love with your load number. Point number four, we can do some extrapolation. I wanna demonstrate extending an existing curve. Enter the point, or on your cursor enters the menu on the point, slide it down to the hand option, just as we did on point number three. It immediately turns to manual. And now you can pick a load number that's higher than anything that you have in the curve. And the curve will follow the, pre the points previous to it. Take the last two points and extend them. And if I went out there to 30, 40, 50%, you can see in the graph how it just keeps projecting the settings. This is a very convenient way to advance the curves rather than the tedious two degrees on the air, two degrees on the fuel, one degree on the air, three degrees on the fuel, back and forth business. You can simply drive them up in unison at the current rate that they were going based on the previous point. Makes for very fast curve building. Again, you get the point number four, you get your load number set in there, you adjust the fuel and air settings, you escape, hit enter, store the point. Now point number four is in there at 30% with the new values. And your chart now has four points in it, 10%, 15, 20, and 30% fire rate. You continue on with this until you get to the top of your curve, pretty much 100% firing rate with as many points as you would like to put in there. With as little as no points firing ignition position, all the way up to a maximum number of 15 points, and you can add and delete points at your leisure. Finally, number 18, we can define how much of that great curve that we built, we want the LMV5 to use on this job site by setting the min and the max values. Important, really important. All that great work that you did setting up the LMV5 and now we should make a backup. I want to stress that even though we had that AZL keyboard in our hands and we saw the AZL display all the values that we entered, all, all of what we had done was on the LMV5 itself. Truthfully, we could put any AZL on our LMV5 and the unit and the program would be the same. The LMV is the flame safeguard. The AZL is the HMI, the human machine interface. Okay, let's do a backup. Let's be a hero, let's not be a zero. We're gonna take everything that we did on the LMV5 and we're gonna take it to the AZL. So we're gonna pick LMV5 to AZL and perform the backup. Past webinars are available on the SEC website. Today we presented the LMV5 parameters and programming. Future, parameter, future webinars in this series shown here for the next five weeks include troubleshooting, VFD, O2 trim, and finally Modbus and ACS 450 software.